Hello, thank you for finding the time for us. You do four to six operations a day, the most complicated of them lasting for days. You complete them all without passing them on to other doctors or to your assistants. Even younger doctors could find such a moral and psychological strains unbearable. How do you cope? You know, there is nothing new about what I do, in fact. In America, surgeons start working very early in the morning and complete several operations over one day. So do Dwight McGoon and John Kirkland, who trained me, and so do all other famous surgeons. When we started moving in here from our office in downtown Moscow, I insisted that operations begin at 6 a.m., while previously they would begin at 9 a.m. You said you do very complicated operations on infants, but at the same time you have successfully operated a patient who was 92 years old. This is unique. Nobody in the West does that. They do. Again, speaking of my friends, famous American surgeons, Dwight McGoon did it, Bob Wallace did it as well, John Kirkling operated kids and adults with equal success. It's just that when you're operating a kid, everyone's attention is drawn to you. When I was elected the president of the National Health League, someone said, it would be good to have a child surgeon chair the league. When I asked what the difference was, I was told that a child surgeon would get more publicity and draw more attention. Well, perhaps this does attract more attention, but still, I know many surgeons who operate kids and adults equally well. First of all, a surgeon needs a lot of experience and practice. Secondly, he or she needs to be an expert in heart bypass circulation methods, which protect the organism, and in cardioplegia, which protects the heart. In that case, given a correct diagnosis, a surgeon is going to be successful with both types of patients. Besides finely honed skin and lots of experience, what else do you need to feel confident in the outcome of an operation? I do all of my operations myself, from start to end. Working along me are two specialists, anesthesiologist and perfusionist. They are the key figures. Then there are assistants who are usually highly skilled professionals. Then there are surgical nurses with whom I work in automatic mode. We barely say a word to each other except for hello in the morning and thank you before moving on to the next surgery. Since sometimes I have to do five operations a day, my team consists of four or five doctors. They are top-class specialists, and when we go on a road show doing demonstration operations across the country, I take the entire team along. We also include an emergency physician in the team. I want people not just to see how Bacaria works, I want them to see my entire team at work. Speaking of your inner feelings, what mood do you need for a successful operation? First of all, I know the outcome of similar operations in global practice, and I know the results that my colleagues and I have achieved previously. As for the mood before an operation, it can be very different. For example, my third surgery today looked simple at first. It was an eight-month-old infant with a severe case of pulmonary artery stenosis. Technically, this is a very simple operation. However, in the case of that specific kid, it was very difficult. I was more anxious before that operation than I was before the far more difficult large vessel transposition operations. Imagine that a child is born whose aorta goes out the right ventricle and pulmonary artery goes out the left one. Well, it should be exactly the opposite. You must swap the two major vessels, relocate coronary vessels and so on. Well, only two or three people in Russia can do such operations. It is very simple in that you can see everything, take this here and put it there, and so on. Therefore, my inner feeling is mostly determined by my skills and experience. However, there is another situation. A very close friend of mine has a grandson with a congenital heart disease. The night before the operation, the father of the kids, that is my friend's son, called me at midnight and demanded that I give him 100% guarantee that nothing wrong happens to the kid. Of course I assured him that everything was going to be all right. In the end, he just pressed me into giving him a 100% guarantee. Naturally, I felt awkward preparing for the operation next day. I always feel uncomfortable when forced to say what I have no right to say because there is no way a doctor can give you a 100% guarantee. Why is there such a large number of heart diseases in Russia? 
Well, the reasons are obvious. Historically, our people have had to handle a lot of stress. During the whole 20th century, there have been wars, revolutions, repressions in Russia. It has been stressful this whole time, and we know that even rats die faster when they are stressed, as opposed to when they are not. That is the first reason. Secondly, we neglect our health and often think that this is something we should not be concerned about. People are not physically active. We eat whatever, buy the food wherever. We don't have good sleeping habits, whereas no matter what shifts you work, you have to always have the same sleeping time. Everything that we call a normal balanced lifestyle is missing in our society. We don't have a national health program as they have in many countries. But the key issue is to encourage healthy eating habits in the country and understanding the importance of physical activity. And we need to pay serious attention to fighting bad habits. We have a lot of smokers in the country, many drinkers, and the drug use rate is also very high. Let's talk about your clinic. You've managed to build one of the best clinics in the world during 20 years, practically. In 10 years, 1999 to 2008. You moved to this building when it was still under construction. Today, your clinic is on the large list of the best ones in the world. How did you do it? Our centre is 52 years old. We used to have to cram into small buildings. There was basically no infrastructure for cardiovascular surgery, even though we had great surgeons, Vladimir Burakovsky, for example. What changed after we moved here? I remember how I first started operating here. After my surgeries in the old building on Leninsky Prospect in Moscow, I would come out completely exhausted, sweating and so on. We had no air conditioning, the lighting was not good, whereas here, after we moved, well, first of all, there was sterile air in the operating room, excellent lighting, a great frontal mirror, very good anesthesiology equipment, new bypass equipment, circulatory support that I've talked about so much. So we were able to create the infrastructure for modern cardiovascular surgery. When we launched in 1998, we were the best equipped clinic in the world. But for two years now, we've been feeling that this equipment is getting old and outdated. This year, the state gave us a significant sum of money, and just recently we bought totally new equipment. And I think that by the end of this year, we will again become a clinic that will be hard for anyone to compete with because we have the equipment that only few clinics do. What would you say is the fundamental difference between your clinic and the American clinics, for example? Well, I'm often asked this question. Russian cardiosurgery and American cardiosurgery, yes, that's right. They do 600,000 and we do 30,000 open-heart surgeries. But I always say you can never compare the Bakulev Center and some clinic in a small American town. You should compare the Bakulev Center with the Boston Clinic or the one in Cleveland, for example. If they come and look, actually many of them come regularly, I don't think they will see much difference. I just want to say that our clinic, wherever you put it on the globe today, will always be the center that does 4,500 bypass surgeries a year. We do 3,600 operations on children. Out of this number, 1,400 are children under the age of one. And together with our sister clinic in Perm last year, we did 7,000 bypass surgeries. Even Chinese clinics don't do this many, where there is a great need right now, and 150 million children there need at least some kind of surgery. It may sound like a silly question, but from a human viewpoint, should a surgery be performed for a patient if he's critically ill but has no money or insurance at all? So what? He will go into surgery, right away. You mean the patient? They had a sudden condition? Some emergency? No questions. Absolutely no questions. Any patient with an emergency will be admitted right away. The rumors about how hard it is to get treatment in a specialized clinic are really exaggerated. It's not so in reality. In reality, we have the pattern of thinking that says, do I really need the surgery? That is the first thing, and secondly, there are opportunities for wider treatment, and we have these opportunities because I think
think the health ministry gave quotas to three dozen federal institutions. It turns out that the mindset in our country is that people with minor sicknesses do not go to see the doctor. They wait until they get to the point where they have to crawl into the doctor's office. And these local organizations that just received new quotas do not admit patients with major problems. So some hospitals with quotas complain that patients are not sent to them, but in reality they could not operate on those patients anyway. It will take some time before we figure out how it is that we have to do 142,000 bypass surgeries, while we only do 32,000. But where is the patient? Neither cardiologists nor general practice doctors can provide that. You perform many surgeries per day, you fly to scientific conferences, you play football, and as I know, you write every Sunday and bring many books with you to read. Do you ever rest at all? Of course you exaggerated a little. I don't play football anymore. I did when we were still in the old building. We had a gym nearby and I played with our interns. One of them gave me a little injury, so I got mad at them and stopped playing after that. But I have an exercise bike, I have a treadmill, my favorite weight station, I can lie with my head down, hang and so forth. Also I have a basketball hoop at home, a tennis wall, so I have my ways. But my main physical activity is the static gymnastics, which I do every day for many hours in the operating room. I don't write much myself now, but I dictate a lot. The girls type up what I dictate, then I edit it, and that's how my writing is done. I've not been on vacation this year because everybody likes to vacation in the summer. I do too. But I noticed if I take my vacation in the summer, the number of surgery reduces. For me, this is a priority because the salary of our employees directly depends on the number of bypass surgeries that we do. So this is a closed issue for me now. Maybe at the beginning of the year I will hide for a few days somewhere outside Moscow, even though of course I would really want to swim in the sea. Last time that happened was a year and a half ago. Are you a superstitious person? Well, my superstitions are limited. For example, when the plane takes off, all lands. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.